Hello and welcome to podcast number 10. Um, today we are joined by Marcus Dempsey from Terabyte IT. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. Thank you. Um, Marcus, I don't know if you want to just give a bit of an intro about who you are, where you're from, um, just to explain to the, the, the many, many listeners that are probably not watching <laughs> yet um, a bit about yourself, really, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm Marcus uh, Dempsey from Terabyte IT. I'm a provisionally, uh, I guess, a cyber essentials and penetration tester. We go around and help companies protect their assets and their services through cybersecurity uh, services. And so lots of that, so that, that's, and that's kind of why we're here today is to talk about the cyber essentials. Um, so you're, is, is it right, you're an assessor for the cyber essentials that's and correct, cyber essentials yeah. plus? Yep, cyber essentials and cyber essentials plus. And that's through the, is it ISME? Yeah, IASME, yeah. IASME, is it? Yeah. I always get that wrong. Because <laughs> um, there's, so my understanding there is, was it, were you saying there's about four or five um, bodies, isn't there, in there's, the UK, I think? Yeah, there's five accreditation bodies at the moment, and under the accreditation bodies, there's hundreds of certification bodies around the country, which you would go to to be certified for Cyber Essentials. So what do you need to do to become an assessor? I'm assuming there's quite a few exams you need to pass. Um, you pretty much go to an accreditation body of your choosing, and then you get trained up. It's normally a couple of days worth of training, answer a lot of questions, go through the, the scope of Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus. Mm. And then, yeah, once you've completed it all and you've passed everything, you're certified. And um, obviously Cyber Essentials is quite a big thing, and very much so if you base the business around it as well <laughs> now, exactly. nowadays, or not, not yeah. necessarily around that, but cybersecurity in general. Yeah. But um, uh, Cyber Essentials is something we recommend <laughs> to all of our customers, and it's, it's just a good um, basic level for everybody to have. Um, which is the Cyber Central's basic, just the very entry level, which I yeah. think is is like three hundred pounds. It's yeah, it's normally um, three hundred pounds plus fat. Yeah, and that gives you that essentially is a self self assessment questionnaire. Um, there are companies, and you can go above and beyond that. I guess you do some consultancy around that as well in terms of helping people um, answer the questionnaire and get to that certain level that they need to get to. That's right. Probably yeah. the basic, but more so for the, the what's the extra level, the pro. Got the name of it now. <laughs> um, there's Cyber Essentials or Cyber plus. S- uh, the Cyber Essentials Plus, yeah, That's which the one. is the on-site assessment. So, what's the difference between? So, you've got the on-site bit. What's yeah. the differences between the basic and the plus version? Yeah. The basic, as you mentioned, was self-assessment. Mm. You go in, you answer sixty odd questions, and you pretty much take it on trust as what you've written is true. The plus will come in, we do an audit, and verify what you've said in the self-assessment is actually true. We'll also do a vulnerability assessment across your whole network. So that's just looking to make sure that you're updating your computers and there's no serious vulnerabilities. You've changed default passwords on your devices, your firewalls, your printers, things like that. And just pretty much saying what you've said in the self-assessment is right. We've noticed lots in the, um, more for our legal customers, that um, obviously they go through loads of stringent requirements and um, particularly when working with banks. Yeah. So banks will have their own, um, their own IT security assessments um, but lots of them nowadays are kind of just shortening that because they can say well have you just got Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus they're name, mainly aiming for um, which it may, may basically means they can skip out a whole load of questions and just go well if you're certified to this level then here's a few extra questions yep. which really really does help out it certainly does so today we're looking to go through um, which I hope will be of, of interest and, and value to, to lots of people listening or watching or whatever you're consuming this Um we're going to run through the Cyber Essentials basic questionnaire. Um, so the, between the basic and the plus, is there a difference in terms of the questionnaire at all? It's just the same questionnaire, but there's some extra checks and things that are done. Yeah, uh, for the Cyber Essentials Plus, there isn't actually a questionnaire. It's just a physical audit of everything you've said on the self-assessment. Right, so okay. Just, just question-based for the self-assessment. And do you have to do the basic first and yes. then go to the plus after? Yeah, you've got so you got to kind of fill out the questionnaire and then... Yeah, you fill out the questionnaire, then you've got up to three months to get the plus. So if you're gotcha. thinking you might be going for the plus as you're doing the self-assessment, make mm. sure you do it. And then as soon as you've certified, you've got that three-month window to actually get the plus. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to go through the questionnaires, basically, the, um, the, the 40, 50, 60-odd questions that we've got here. Um for those listening, if you happen to be trying to certify for the Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus, um, this will be hopefully very, very good for you just to listen through. Um, if you're struggling with any of the answers, then um, listen in. So we'll start off. I'm just scanning through the questions at the moment because the first lot of questions are what's your name, where do you come from, what your business does, which we don't need to answer for you. Um, question. So question A 2.1, um, if we're going to follow this um to the letter here so does the scope of this assessment cover your whole organization um this is um 
first of all, it, it talks about the cyber cyber insurance. So as part of the Cyber Essentials Basic, you get cyber uh, you get free cyber insurance if you meet certain requirements. I don't know if you're aware of what the requirements are to, to get that. Yeah, this is part of the ISME um, yeah. part of it. Um, so if you're UK domiciled business and turn over less than £20 million, you can actually get up to £25,000 uh, with cyber liability insurance. And is it the kind of thing that it's a freebie, you're probably still better off going to get your own insurance policy? I guess it depends on the size of the company. It is a freebie, it's there. Mm. You know, there's no reason why you wouldn't want to take it. Yeah. But obviously, if you're a bigger company, really that's... Concerned. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a big making company, sure you get the right coverage, because then yeah. I guess the coverage you get is the coverage you get. You don't exactly. get to pick or choose or, yeah. or anything. Um, so um, in terms of that first question, it's just saying, does the scope of this assessment cover your whole organisation? Yep. So this 99.9% of the time, it'd always be a yes. But if you're a larger company, that maybe you've got multiple companies or divisions within the business... You might only just want to certify one part of the business. You could just say um, maybe only the engineering department of Acme Limited is going to be certified for Cyber Essentials, and then you would just put that in, and then it's just the scope based around that. Gotcha. But you'd okay. have to make sure that you have got actual physical firewalls in place to separate off the various divisions within the business. Right, okay, because that division as an entity has to be protected, basically. Exactly, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, cool. Um if this is not a whole organisation, then what scope description would you like to appear on your certificate website? I guess that's just saying you want to exactly. call it the, the network you want or the department or whatever you want yeah, it to be. that's just going to be whatever's printed on your CV. I was going to say the CV. <laughs> <laughs> Anything on the certificate. Um, geographical relations of the business. I'm sure everyone can fill that out on yeah. their questionnaires already. Um, please list the quantities of laptops, computers and servers within the scope of this assessment. You must include the model and operating system versions for all devices. That's Is that a recent addition with the model and operating system? It is a recent addition, uh, mainly because Windows 10 is now, now out and Microsoft's no longer supporting the older or original versions of Windows 10. Yeah. So this is the one that normally catches a lot of people out. So yeah, as it says, list all the c devices that you've got. So it could be we have 20 Windows 10 Pro machines and then put the version on, so 1809 or 1903, and things mm. like that. If you don't actually put the version number in, it'll get rejected and sent back for you to put it back in. Uh, and that's another good point, actually, because I know previously when Cyber Essentials first came out, you can kind of just go through and go, yes, no, yes, 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 and then submit, and you'll be fine. Yeah. In terms of leaving, because there are, there are notes under every single question now, and I get asked the question um, from time, time to time, how long, how short do you need to leave notes? Does it matter on the question or do you always have to leave notes in as much detail as possible? Most of the questions, um, it's just a simple yes. Uh, where it just If it doesn't say describe next to the question, you normally just say yes or no. Okay. Personally, I prefer everyone to stick at least, at least a sentence, maybe two down on it. It just helps the assessor actually grade you and understand your business and how it goes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's very so useful. So more information, the better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So, um, so make sure we've yeah identified all the machines you've got, the, the versions that you're running. I guess you don't really have to go down to versions of like service pack levels for no, no, it's just, just the, the main, main version number of the operating system. So for for Mac, for example, is just Mac Mojave. You don't have to do Mojave ten, eleven point whatever no, we're no, on nowadays. Yeah. Just literally the operating yeah. system. Cool. Um, question A two point seven is please list the quantities of tablets and mobile devices within the scope. You must include model and um, uh, operating system versions for all devices. Yeah, again, this is a similar sort of thing. The last question, if you use any mobile devices or tablets or anything for business use or has any type of business information on it, list the devices down. So if you've got, I don't know, Android or Chromebooks sort of thing, put down the quantity of the device and, again, the operating system. Cool. But again, yeah. you have to go into specifics of exactly. iOS 12 point something something, just yeah, Apple iPhone, iOS, iOS yeah. and that's, that's, that's it. That's right, yeah. Cool. A2.8 is pre please provide a list of networks that will be in scope for the assessment. Yeah, again, you don't have to be too detailed on this. It could be um, main head office network and wireless network if they've got two networks split up. Right. Or maybe for bigger companies, you might have engineering, operating, system, uh, operating services, something like that. You know, Just describe what networks you've got in the business. So if you're a single office but have, I don't know, for example, us here, that's a good enough example, a you know, production network, which is a wired network, yep. a wireless production network, 
an engineering network, a guest network, you'd have to declare those all as separate networks within there? Yes, if you want them in the scope of Cyber Essentials, yeah. Cool. And if you'd said previously that your whole company's in scope, then yeah, it's all those networks. Brilliant, thank you. You, d- you don't have to list any IP addresses or anything like that, though. Oh, okay, just the yeah. names. Just, just the names, yeah. Overall summary of what they are. Um, please provide a list of network equipments that will be used in scope for the assessment, including firewalls and routers. And it does say specifically you do not need to include switches or wireless access points. Yeah, again, so that's primarily uh, any routers, switches, uh, even though it says no switches, pretty much firewalls, anything that communicates traffic around your network and the border endpoints. Anything like that. that can basically be impacted for security, I guess. Exactly, really. yeah. Yeah, but not wireless access points from no. other things there. Um, please provide, so this is A2.10, please provide the name and role of the person who's responsible for managing the information. I um, assume that's generally probably whoever's filling out the, the questionnaire or the, the business owner for smaller businesses or if you've got a specific IT director or something on those lines. Yeah, it's pretty much as you said. It's nine times out of ten, it's whoever's filling the self-assessment in. So Someone who looks after the IT. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next section is, uh, that's insurance questions, which I guess we don't really need to go through. Are you based in the UK and is it less than 20 million? Uh, if you've answered yes this, what's your gross turnover? Uh does the company have any operations in the US? No, no, let's skip those ones. Office firewalls and internet gateways. So we're now on uh, 4.1. And this is where we start getting to the, I guess, the nitty gritty. It's more talking about kind of hardware and, and, you know, and your use of it. Um, so 4.1 is, do you have firewalls at the boundaries between your organization's internal networks and the internet? Yeah, as it says, it's, you know, for Cyber Essentials, it's all about security, protecting your business. So it's making sure that you actually have a physical device that is separating all your IT kit from the internet. Um, if you're a home office, that could be BT Hub sort of thing. If it's here, it could be I don't know, Meraki or Juniper, any type of device. So you just put down, yes, I've got X, Y, and Z. Is, is it frowned on a port to use things like the BT Home Hubs and Virgin Super Hubs? It's not frowned upon as long as you've got something that protects your internal network from the outside. That's all we're looking for in in the basic cyber essentials. Cool, yeah. excellent, thank you. And so for this question, do you have to do you have to list them? Do you, um, do you have firewalls? It doesn't ask you to list anything. It's just asking for a yes or no. And yeah, that pretty things. much just stick down at yes, um, BT Home Hub or something like that. Yeah, for argument's sake. When you first receive so this is a four point two. When you first receive an internet router or hardware firewall device. It will have a default password on it. Has this initial password been changed on all such devices, and how do you achieve this? Yeah, so here again, we're Cyber Essentials is making sure that you're doing security by design. Um, so as soon as you get any new hardware, whether it's a firewall, switch, printer, or anything, ideally, mm. just go in, change the password from whatever the default is, and put it as something nice and complicated. Interestingly, and this, uh, this looks like a recent addition, so um, particularly for BT Hubs and Virgin Super Hubs and what have you, um, it does say default password must be changed, including those that come with a unique password pre-configured. So that's something I... Because I always wondered that if they had a pre-configured, because they're still unique to the devices when yeah. they get shipped out. So you do now have to change the passwords. Yeah. Well, I say now. It might have been in there for the last <laughs> three, four years, as far as I remember. Um, but you do have to change them on, on everything, yeah. effectively. Um, A4.3 is the new password on all your internet routers and hardware firewall devices at least eight characters in length and difficult to guess. Yep, as it says, um, make sure the password's difficult to guess. Um, ideally, use a password manager and generate a nice strong password. Yeah, yeah. and store it somewhere so you don't forget. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, 4.4, do you change the password when you believe it may have been compromised? How do you achieve this? Yeah, again, this is um, just making sure that if you think you've had a compromise, whether or not, I don't know, someone's left your business and there's something dodgy's happened um, or you've started getting emails coming into an account that's associated with that account yeah just make sure you change it and then just describe how you've actually done it so you could say if we have a compromise we will log on to the device change the password via a password manager and store it cool excellent thank you uh 4.5 is do you have any services enabled that that are accessible externally from your internet's routers or hardware firewall devices for which you do not have a documented business case yeah, so this is making sure that you're not actually serving, I guess, business critical information from your office and just giving out personal information or potentially confidential information to the internet willy-nilly sort of thing. You so what are the most common things that do get um, access external, I guess, like email servers for one? Yeah, um, it could be, I don't know, HR information, payroll information that 
They might have temporarily hosted internally for testing purposes, so they've opened up some ports on the firewall so mm. people can get in and browse it and then forgotten to lock it up once they've uh, done the testing, something like okay. that. Or, you know, some developer might have done some testing and gone from there. But and again, in terms of the notes on this one, how much um, information is required? It's, it's just saying kind of the business case should be documented and recorded. Um, is that kind of, again, it's, I guess it's with all of these, as much information as, as possible, really? Yeah, you don't have to give war and peace, you know, a sentence or two would be good. You're just saying, yes, there's a business case for this. X, Y, and Z will be done. Cool. 4.6. Um, if you do have services enabled on the firewall, um, do you have a process to ensure they're disabled in a timely manner when they're no longer required? Describe that process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's just making sure that once the service is no longer required, you just make sure that you close the holes in it. And in the in the in just the little notes here, it's saying that um, you should have a process that you follow to do this, um, i.e. when are the services reviewed, who decides to remove the services, who checks that it has been done. Is that normally, I guess that forms part of an IT policy, those yeah. steps? Yeah, it'd be an IT policy or change control within that policy sort of thing. So you're just making sure that, you know, you're making sure everything's safe and secure. And if anything So if you're answering change, the questions and you don't have one of those policies, I guess you should write a quick policy to say that and then <laughs> you can answer yes to the question. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, and we've did, we, we did this with a few of our customers the first time around, because obviously this has been around for a few years, that... Um, because it's an online questionnaire you're filling out. I don't know if it's different with other certification bodies, but it's an online questionnaire. It you fill is, out. yeah. And it gives you the chance to go through and answer yes to what you can, either answer no or don't complete the ones you can't do. Yeah. Then you can fix those problems and then answer yes and then get the certification after. That's right, yeah. Um, so it's very much not a, um, you're not assessed and then you fail and then that's it. You can, as long as you've kind of made made reasonable efforts um, to fix things. Um, and that, that was something else, actually, I might be jumping back and forth um, a bit here as well, that's, you don't have to, unless it's changed, you don't have to answer yes to every single question, do you, to, to pass? No, there's a few questions that you have to actually say no to, uh, which will come up. Um, but 99% of them, they are actually yes, you have to actually answer to. Okay. But unless you've got a good explanation of why you've said no to it, then the assessor yeah. might say, fair enough, they've said no, it should be a yes, but they've got a good business case why they've said no to that reason, and it's on the assessor to say yes or no right, from okay. that. Which cool. is why I say give more information. More yeah. information is the better. Definitely helps there. Yeah. Um, and then on 4.7 is have you configured your routers or hardware firewall devices so they block all services from being advertised to the internet? Most by, most do by default, don't they? They do, yeah. They do now. Um, so it's really only if you're using, I say only if you're using a really old one, but then if you're using a really old one, then you wouldn't be certified for Cyber Essentials because it needs to be within kind of warranty. Yeah, and it, and yeah it needs to be supported, yeah. Um, so generally that is always a yes unless you have any specific cases as yeah. to why. Uh, the next one in 4.8 is, are your internet routers or hardware firewalls configured to allow access to their configuration settings over the internet? Yeah, most people will probably say no to this one, but you have got various products like Meraki or mm. um, other services that actually have their like configured... Cloud managed. Yeah, cloud yeah. managed services. So if that's the case, you could say, yes, it is. Um, configuration is set to the internet, but it's whitelisted or we've got two-factor authentication in you know, detail why it is managed via the cloud. Yeah, and, and that leads on to 4.9 because it, it says, if yes, is there a documented business requirement for this access? Well, I guess that, that maybe not doesn't link into it so much because, for example, if you use Cisco Meraki, it's not really a business requirement. It's a requirement to use the product because yeah. that's how the product Necessity. works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like you say, if there's two-factor authentication or you've locked it down so that you can only access it from yeah. certain IP addresses, mm -hmm. um, then that's the best thing um, to do there. Um, which then follows on to 4.10, which is if yes, is the access to the settings protected by two-factor authentication or by only allowing trusted IP access to yep. the settings? List the option which is used, mm -hmm. which I think we've covered off already. Um, 4.11 is do you have software firewalls enabled on all of your computers and laptops? Yeah, this is a mandatory requirement uh, for Cyber Essentials. If you don't have software firewalls on your computer, you will get a fail on it. Um, so make sure you've got, if it's Windows, Windows Defender, if it's Mac... Um, not entirely sure what it is on the Mac, but make sure you've got firewalls on the Mac. Is it called on a Mac? Ooh. It's probably just called firewall or something, <laughs> isn't it? It is. It's not a, uh, visible to the end user. But it's, it's, it's you can switch it off, though, can't you? you I'm sure it is like firewall. Can, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. firewall, it's literally called firewall. <laughs> there we go. Good old Mac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but just make sure you've got a firewall installed. Yeah, and, and for um, bigger businesses, you can force that, lots of that with things like group policy. That's so right. it just forces it on for everybody. So you have to go around every single machine and, and check and make sure it's switched on. Um, 
4.12 is, if no, is this because software firewalls are only commonly available, oh, sorry, are not commonly available for the operating system you are using? Please list the operating systems. Yeah, so it's very rare anyone will put anything in this one, but it could be someone's running a very weird version of Linux or Unix, something like that, which doesn't actually have firewalls that are supported. Right, So okay. if that's the case, put down the operating system and the reasons why it's, yeah, mm -hmm. there's nothing on it. And I guess typically the answer to those should be that there is a, hardware file or something sat in front of that that is protecting exactly. it from yeah. those point of views. Excellent. That is section four done. So on to section five, which is secure configuration. Um, I'll read a bit at the top of here because it's we, we go through it might as well. Computers are often not secure upon default installation. An out-of-the-box setup can often include an administrative account with a standard publicly known default password, like admin admin or admin password, which many things do still come with. Um, and one or more unnecessary one or more unnecessary user accounts enabled sometimes with special access privileges and pre-installed but unnecessarily applications or services. All of these present security risks. Of course they do. Question 5.1. Um, so this applies to servers, computers, laptops, tablets, mobile phones, basically anything you're accessing, anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, were you able to do so, have you removed or disabled all of the software that you do not use on your laptops, computers, servers, tablets, and mobile phones? Describe how you achieve this. Yeah, so this one's just making sure that you only run the software that you need and is supported. So all the bloatware or all the additional applications that you get with Windows, for example, mm -hmm. if you're a business, you know, just uninstall all those additional games and everything that you, you don't use. So and you go to PC World, not that we tell anyone to go to PC World, <laughs> um, you buy a new laptop or a new, new desktop, it comes with a load of junk on there, effectively. It's all, yeah. The, yeah, all the games, like you say, Office 365 comes pre-installed if you're not using Office 365. Um even lots of the, the HP system tools and things, you don't really need half of those because yeah. they're just kind of helping about systems. It's, exactly. You just need to make sure that you take steps to remove those. Yeah. Um, we have a process we go through for um, any kit that comes through our workshop that we, we, we do that. We basically wipe them, do a fresh Windows install that's clean, and then we install all the you know, customers' apps and, yeah. and what have you on there. Um, do you have to do that too much on Mac OS? There's not too much extra comes on Mac nowadays. I don't think there's too much on, on the Mac. But um, again, if you've had the machine for a while and you've installed mm. stuff over the period of a couple of years, if you no longer use it under Cyber Essentials, you should really get rid of the older stuff that you no longer use. Very true. Yeah. There's some new features on Mac, isn't there, that offloads old apps that you don't use anymore? Isn't that some new Mojave feature? If you don't use an app for like a year or something, it decides that it'll uninstall it all. It definitely does on iOS, yeah, application offloading. Right, right. okay. Maybe it's one of the soon-to-coming features or something. Um, cool. Okay, 5.2 is have you insured all your laptops, computers, service tablets, and mobile devices? Um, long phrase. Only contain necessary user accounts that are regularly used in the course of your business. Yeah, so this one is just making sure that you only have the user accounts that you actually need. If you're in, a, I guess, a corporate environment with Active Directory and stuff like that, you only have a, a low-level user account for yourself and then a local administrator account or a global domain account for accessing all the higher edge type things. If you're a home business, um, again, just make sure that you've got a, a low level user account and an administrator account. Is that things Which, like the um, guest accounts? Because Windows machines, definitely Macs, have the option to have a guest account where you right. don't need a password for, I think. That's right, yeah. Just make sure that's disabled and not, not switched on. Anywhere. Exactly, yeah. Just any accounts that you've got, which you no longer use, make sure they're either disabled or got rid of. Cool. Fab. 5.3 is, have you changed the default password for all user and administrator accounts on all of your laptops, computers, servers, tablets, and smartphones uh, to a <laughs> non-guessable password of eight characters or more? Yeah, again, this is, I think I've touched on that before, but yeah, mm -hmm. just making sure that all your administrative accounts or any accounts that have, I guess, high-level function to devices and stuff like that, just make sure they change from the default and... Yeah, make it nice and secure again. They're normally pretty good on, on again, I, I guess new machines when you're doing the new setups, they force you to set secure passwords, do, but yeah. it's more, I guess, on older machines where you might have a administrator password account still left lingering on there somewhere. Yeah. Even stuff like um, printers for configuration and stuff like that, make sure they've changed. Yeah. A lot of people forget to do that. Yeah, we still see that with lots of, um, we, we go onto site and find a printer and someone's having a problem, they can't print to it or it's not working properly. Well, let's just try admin, admin. Oh, we're <laughs> into it. That's a surprise. Yeah. Um, really surprised with that. And CCTV cameras. Yeah. We see that quite a lot, particularly with CCTV. It's quite scary because leaving those open are um, quite dangerous. 5.4, uh, simple question. Do all of your users and administrators use passwords of at least eight characters? Yeah. It's just a yes. Yes, pretty much, yeah. 
if you say no, yeah, it's, it's going to be a fail. Yeah. Uh, again, with things like Active Directory, you can set um, minimum characters um, and complexity requirements. You can yep. force people to have more than eight pass eight eight letters, add in special characters, digits, yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, that's quite quite useful. Five point five. Do you run software that provides sensitive or critical information? that shouldn't be made public to external users across the internet. I'll just read the description on this one just to clarify. Your business might run software that allows people outside of the company on the internet to access information within the business via an external service. This could be a VPN server, a mail server, or an internet application that could provide to your customers as a product. I think that's where you're referring to like HR systems and exactly, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, in all cases, these applications provide information com- that is confidential to your business and your customers that you would not want to be public ses- accessible. Important to clarify, this question does not apply to cloud services such as Google Drive, Office 365, or Dropbox. And actually, I was answering this earlier thinking, do I need to, because obviously data stored in Office 365 or Dropbox, it is external, um, but we're not actually sharing that with customers. So I guess that's kind of partially why. If you use only services and do not run your own service, you should should answer no. So really, that is literally if you are using anything that's um, externally accessible. Kind of the same, same as the, the previous answer, really. Exactly, yeah. 5.6, if yes, do you ensure all of these services use a password of at least eight characters and that your systems do not restrict the length of the password? That's interesting. Do not restrict mm-hmm. the length of the password. Yes, yeah, so that's just making sure that if you do actually host various services that have confidential information, is it password protected? You have to actually log in and authenticate to get that information. Completely random question. Is there a, what, what's, what's your recommended password length? Is there a recommended <laughs> password length? Personally, for myself, a uh, minimum of 25 characters. Blimey, okay. Um, just Is that more like phrases rather than kind of random jumbled letters? And just use a password very manager. Good memory. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I just use password <laughs> manager to say a minimum of 25 and generate me some garbage. And, didn't, uh, didn't there used to be, was it 16 characters? It used to be like the uncrackable password of 16 characters? Yeah, um, used to be. Yeah, I think Microsoft still recommend, I think, 16 characters for a lot of their passwords. Right, okay. Because um, it just takes too long to even sort of like brute force and things. It would just take you know, exactly. like years or some unfathomable amount yeah. of time. I'm just paranoid, so I just say 25 and go from there. We do try and, um, for some of our um, more sensitive um, customers, we, we set kind of above 16 characters. Um, I think our passwords are like eight or nine characters. You probably sh- shouldn't be telling people that because they're all going to know that they're all like eight or nine characters. Shush, we'll, we'll cut that out. Um, <laughs> 5.7 is, if yes, do you ensure that you change the passwords if you believe they've been compromised? Yeah, so if you've... I don't know, I've seen some weird things happening on your user account. Maybe your mouse is flicking around or stuff's popping up on your screen or you've subscribed to a vibe in porn. Maybe, you know, mm. a good service to see whether or not you've been breached. Then, yeah, change your password and, and go from there. And how far should you, I guess, both in, both in the questionnaire here and, and in general, how far should you go? So a user's uh, clicked on a phishing email and they've, they've been compromised. Yeah. Should you then worry about the other accounts you've got in your network and your admin passwords and those kind of things? Ideally, yes, you should. Um, this is where it goes to making sure you've got unique passwords and credentials for every single service that you have. Yeah. So worst case, if you have been compromised, it's only going to affect that one service. But if yeah. you share those credentials across numerous services, then, yeah, you, you've got a bit of a, a headache. Uh, so generally, if you're following <laughs> best practice of individual passwords, then you only worry about the one password that's been compromised. Exactly. You don't have to worry about like, your admin passwords no. or, or other users' passwords. Good. Yeah. 5.8 is... Uh, Another follow-on. If yes, are your systems set to lock out after 10 or fewer unsuccessful login attempts or limit the number of login attempts to no more than 10 within five minutes? Yeah, so that's just uh, making sure that it's safeguarding against brute force attempts. So if someone's trying to constantly try and break in and use your credentials, then it'll lock that account out for a period of time. And that's um, just, I was just reading back up there. So this this applies to mobile devices and tablets as well. So um, I don't know what it defaults to on things like iPhones because I know if you try and, you know, type in a PIN number incorrectly. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that is enabled by default. Um, that's something that probably is worth checking. I know it is on an Android. I don't know about an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know what it is. Well, yeah. uh, well half the half thing is when, so when you um, sign into a corporate email account, as you get on Android as well, it will force on the corporate policies of you need to, you know, 10 attempts or five attempts or whatever you set. Yeah. Um, lots of that is defaulted. Um, so you might find it's definitely worth going in to check into your iPhone settings yeah. um, just to make sure that you are locking people out. Completely lost my place in the questionnaire now. Where are we going? Um, uh, 5.9 is, if yes, do you have a password policy that guides all of your users? Yeah, again, you know, you should have a password policy that's applied to all users. You know, this 
part of the induction. They should be reading all the policies, sign it off if they need to, and just so they're aware of what they need to do for the passwords. And I guess that also can be going back to like um, Active Directory and Group Policy. You can control that exactly, through, so they can't set anything that's um, not not secure enough. Yeah. Um, in terms of your policy, and then five point ten um, is is also run or also play disabled on all your systems. Um, maybe explain a bit around why the reasoning behind that. Yeah, um, it's not so much of an issue now, but on the older versions of Windows, you used to be able to plug a USB drive in or a CD ROM. CD ROMs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and back in the days, they just automatically run anything you wanted. So there could be some malicious, malicious, malicious software or anything that could uh, go and infect your computer. Now, as long as you've got auto run turned off or something in place where it'll actually prompt you so it'll come up saying something's been plugged into your drive do you want to run this that protects you against from actually running malicious software straight away yeah it gives you that chance to actually look and go hang on i didn't just plug something in or i didn't just try you and actually run something. want to yeah, yeah definitely um, had a question from the audience. Um, <laughs> would you recommend all businesses? Sorry, completely. We, it's uh, on the same topic, but not part one of the questions. Would you com- would you recommend all businesses complete the Cyber Central certification, even if they don't currently require it? I would say yes. Um, it gives you that chance of knowing where you stand, and it gives you that reputational advantage over other businesses as well. Mm. So it kind of protects you, safeguards you. Other companies know that you are doing your best to safeguard. Your I think it also data. helps. When you're, if you're taking on and acquiring new customers, because they might then well ask for it as part of you becoming a supplier or, or, or supplying services to them. Exactly. So if you already hold that, it obviously doesn't hold you up from winning any new business because you can say, yes, we've got it, rather than, uh, yes, hang on a minute, let's just go and do that and then come back again and have won it. <laughs> so yes, yeah. um, I would say my answer would be yes to all businesses. Um, it just shows, not really that it... Yes, to get the badge is good, but just to make sure you've taken the basic steps because they're yeah. sick with smaller businesses and startups. Um, I can probably reel off most of these questions and say most startups probably aren't doing half of these. Yeah. You know, changing default passwords, most people probably just order BT Broadband, chuck it in, and you're done. Yeah. And don't bother changing passwords. So it's definitely worth um, going through something like this. Same just with the user sure. accounts as well. You know, you yeah. get Windows by default, that's a local administrator access. So yeah, very true. Yeah. So yes is our answer. Collective answer of yes, do it. <laughs> um, on to the next sessions. This is uh, software patching, and um, this is just generally about patching your um, operating systems, your applications, making sure you're regularly updating everything. Um, so question 6.1 is, are all operating systems and firmware on your devices supported by a supplier that produces regular fixes for any security problems? Yeah, so this is just making sure you keep your systems up to date. Um, as we said at the start, versions of Windows 10 now, all the versions are no longer supported. So you just got to keep making sure they're kept up to date and going from there. And yeah, if you've got any firmware like your laptop or various devices, just check with the manufacturer, making sure there's, if there's any updates, get them installed as well. That's an inter- interesting one actually because most people will say yes, we will always install you know Windows updates and everything. Yeah. But they probably for the smaller businesses probably don't think about the firmware that's on their routers or their switches or anything along those lines, the networking kit. Yeah. Um, I would hazard a guess and say most people that have answered yes to that question probably haven't actually. <laughs> I'm actually doing everything on it. Um, yeah. I've never really thought of that in detail. Thankfully, we do it here. We obviously check. Um, and um, But it's, it's definitely worth considering there, that's for sure. And that's Six. where the Cyber Essentials Plus comes into it. Because you'll go in through and, and check everything, it. firmware yeah. versions. So you're actually logging into all the equipment at that point, checking firmware versions. Maybe, maybe not all of them. We'll okay. just point and say, let's have a look at that one. And just make just sure a random, it's kind of yeah. random security check that like you get at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 6.2, are all applications on your devices supported by a supplier that produces regular fixes for any security problems? Yeah, so this one's looking at third-party applications outside of the operating system. So if you're using, God forbid, Adobe Flash mm. or something like that, <laughs> ma- making sure that's up, up to date. Um, Adobe Reader, Office 365. Um, yeah, anything that's outside of the operating system, just make sure it's kept up to date. If you can, set it to automatically update and prompt you. Yeah, very much so. Lots yeah. of those can be automated nowadays. They can, yeah. Um, and most programs include also update facilities with them. So just, yeah. just definitely meet, definitely use them, basically. Um, 6.3 is, is all software licensed in accordance with the publisher's recommendations? That's an interesting one that will catch out um, a few people that think they can buy one copy of Microsoft Office and install it on 10 computers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Again, um, Do you come across that much? From the self-assessment point of view, no, they always say yes. I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not actually going and um, checking, look at the licensing and stuff, which mm. isn't actually part of Cyber Essentials. But right. 
sometimes when we do audits or pre-assessments and stuff like that and actually go and talk through them, it will actually uncover a right, few things okay. like that and then they realise they have to, they've all either undersubscribed or oversubscribed licences. We've had a few. It feels horrible. Like, so we'll take on like a new customer and then make a certain, obviously you, you can't know everything when you take on a new customer. Yeah. And we'll make some certain assumptions, and then we'll we'll uncover that they've been licensed. You know, bought one license and licensed the entire company with one product, <laughs> and then have to be the one that delivers the bad news of we well, now need to spend a few thousand pounds to fix the problem that you didn't have with your previous IT company because they didn't pick it up, or they they knew about it and, and ignored it, or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, the best we can do is say, well, here's the problem. This is what you need to do to fix it. It's kind of up to you whether you do or, or don't. Um, but our recommendation is you need to. Yeah. Um, I don't think we haven't really. Ever, uh, Microsoft assessments. That's the only um, time when it has caused issues. Because um, I say cause issues, we always warn customers that they could be due a Microsoft assessment because they they haven't we haven't done them for a while now. Actually, I don't know if you've heard of um, the Microsoft the Sam audits. Yeah, that I've Microsoft heard. used to do a lot of them, but they've uh, literally all like that was more about along um, like volume licensing customers. Yeah. but I've not seen any come through in the last couple of years. Yeah, it's just died a death recently. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice because they were useless. The, um, <laughs> so they used to outsource it to. It wasn't Microsoft that actually carried out the audits. It was. I think I learned something that if the, if an email address at Microsoft has a V in front of it, it means they're like temp staff or contracted staff. Right. So it's V dash like name. Yeah. Or name dash V or something. It means it means they weren't actually employed by Microsoft. And we had issues all the time where we'd, we'd start off an audit, we'd reply back and forth, and then that person would just have vanished and leave the company or whatever would happen. They'd leave, leave no forwarding information. You could look through all of their email signatures. Yeah. It would have no other contact information whatsoever for them, their department, like anybody. You'd then phone Microsoft who says, I'm not clear where that person is. <laughs> um, and we, we ran into that quite a few times, which was frustrating. Um, but sorry, I digress. <laughs> um, so that was, which one was that one? That was uh, 6.3 is all, all license in accordance. Uh, interesting one. So 6.4, are all high risk or security critical security updates for operating systems and firmware installed within 14 days of release. Describe how you achieve this. Yeah, this one can be a tricky one, especially for the firmware side of things, but for Cyber Essentials, you only have to install the critical and security updates only within 14 days. Other updates can be applied later. Obviously, we recommend apply them as soon as possible with everything else, but this is where they're ensuring that all the applications are set to automatically update across everything, just so they install everything. So we had to change our patching for this because we, we did a monthly patch yeah, window which most customers, I guess most most IT companies did for a while. Yeah, and um, when this changed, we then had to change to um, every other week. Yeah, so now every two weeks we patch all of our customer servers to keep some keeps them all within Cyber Essentials. Yeah, it, it can uh, trip a lot of people up this one. But do you get many issues with um, dodgy updates with people rushing to install the latest security, particularly with Microsoft, which haven't been yeah. the had the best reputation most recently for their uh, updates? Touchwood, no. <laughs> <laughs> but cool. um, yeah. Time will tell. <laughs> Six point five is are all high risk or critical security updates for applications, um, including any associated files and plugins such as Adobe Flash, installed within fourteen days of release. Similar as the last. Yeah, similar thing as well. Um, I guess one thing I try and make people aware of as well, if they run WordPress or websites stuff like that, to make sure those plugins are up to date as well. Yep, that's very true. Actually, in terms of um, WordPress, where does that fall in? Because where it's asking about servers, and computers, and networking, do you have to say anything about your website where it's hosted or anything? No, not unless you actually manage it and I guess manage the underlying operating system of the website. So if you're, so if you happen to host it in house, exactly, yeah, times, yeah, then that would fall in that. But if it's just from a hosting provider, then no, you don't have to worry about it. Cool. Um, does that apply to the WordPress? I guess the WordPress updates. So if you're installing WordPress updates, yeah, so you're not managing the underlying like linux or windows system or whatever it's sat on but yeah. if you have to if you're responsible for going oh there's wordpress 5.4 or whatever install it is that that's kind of you need to be making sure you're it, yeah, it's kind of borderline on that one yeah okay because there's no specific questions i think that answers that i will answer that question normally the websites and that's out of scope but yeah i tend to just tell people anyway just as being it's nice kind of best practice it's exactly yeah very if, much you, so. if you're doing the business side of things you might as well do everything else mm. yeah uh, six point six is: Have you removed any applications on your devices that are no longer supported and no longer receive regular fixes for problems, security problems? Yeah, again, this is just making sure that you keep software installed there uh, that you use and is up to date and is supported. If you don't use it or is no longer supported, then there's a risk of compromise. So, so either everyone, everyone uninstalling Flash soon because <laughs> exactly does if you've still Flash it. nowadays, I haven't had it installed for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And even if you want to use Flash, I think it forces you to go through like all sorts of hoops and hurdles to enable it on your browsers nowadays because yeah. it's just massively 
horribly insecure and they keep <laughs> releasing updates every other week. Yeah. Um, that's Cyber Essentials. <laughs> um, so the <laughs> next section is on user accounts, all based on user accounts now. Um, so I'll just read the summary. It's important to only give users access to resources. Resources? Resources? Is that American? Mm. Um, and data necessary for their roles and no more. All users need to have unique accounts and should not be carrying out day-to-day tasks such as invoicing or dealing with email whilst logged in with a user with administrative pri- privileges. That's a big no-no. Definitely don't <laughs> do that. Uh, which allows significant changes to the way your computer systems work. And the reasoning behind that, and um, we don't think we've had a case of it because our customers are pretty good generally, is that you could be accessing your email with an admin level account, you open a dodgy email, and suddenly, two seconds later, your whole network's encrypted and you've lost access. That's really kind of the brunt of it. Um, (laughs) So question 7.1 to get started is, are users only provided with user accounts after a process has been followed to approve their creation? Describe the process. Yeah, so this is just, I guess, ensuring that you've got an onboarding process or an induction phase. So you get taken on with the company... There's a process to actually give you the credentials and the right level of privilege. So that would be just creating their Active Directory account or email account. Exactly, it is, yeah. Lines. Assign them to various groups and, and things like that. Yep. 7.2, can you only access laptops, computers, and servers in your organization by entering a unique username and password? Unique being the key word there, I yeah, think. <laughs> that one's just making sure that you actually have to log in to the device. So if it's on a computer, put your username and password in or PIN number, things like that. Same yeah. with the phone, yeah. 7.3, how do you ensure you have deleted or disabled any accounts for staff who are no longer with your organization? Reverse yeah. of 7.1, <laughs> isn't it? Just offboarding. Exactly, yeah, offboarding. If someone leaves or gets fired or something like that, just make sure the accounts have been disabled, any access that they've got has been revoked. 7.4 is do you ensure that staff only have priv- privileges they need to do their job, and how do you do this? Yeah, again, that's just briefly explain yeah, how they give what permissions they've been given, stuff like that. Um, just give them least privilege access. Yeah. Uh, only give them access to what they need. So you don't have, um, say, marketing staff with full access to financial information, all those kind of things, exactly. really. Just kind yeah. of basic, basic things, really. Yeah. is very much basic. Thus, the Cyber Essentials basic. Exactly, yeah. Um, next section, which is still seven, uh, but this is around about administrative accounts now. So we've gone from user accounts to admin accounts. Um, 7.5 is do you have a formal process for giving someone access to systems as a, a at an administrator level describe the process yeah so this is given um, I guess defining the formal approach for giving someone an administrative level access so again it could be a part of the onboarding process if you've been bringing on a, a new sysadmin for example or if someone's been promoted from a, a lower level user into an administrator what processes do you have in place to ensure that you know they, yeah. I guess earn the respect or the right to have high level um, privilege and it says you must have a formal written down process so does that form is that part of i guess an it policy or where would that typically sit yeah that would be an it policy it could be part of an hr policy for i don't know a new role or something like that but you know as long as it's written down and describes the steps could that be part so i guess that could be not not an onboarding process because that's the wrong word but when someone's changed department um, yeah. You kind of go through an onboarding for that department. So exactly. just put, as long as that's kind of a process in itself, yeah, um, that covers that one off. So 7.6 is how do you ensure that staff only, and uh, this is interesting, how do you ensure that staff only use administrative accounts to carry out administrative activities such as installing software or making configuration changes, basically making sure they're not accessing web browsing and emails yeah. whilst they're logged on as an admin? This one can be a quite a tricky one, but it's just making sure that everyone always uses lower-level privilege access over administrative access um, you only get access to administrator accounts when you actually need to do something so so is that in terms of their their admin accounts enabled when they need to use it and disabled after or because that's probably <laughs> whilst that would be ideal i guess it's probably not very realistic exactly it it can depend on upon the business sort of thing depending on the size of the business the nature of the business everything else but it's i guess it's ensuring that 99 percent of the people only have low level accounts and there's only that small set of people who have admin accounts and then training them i guess the best way of actually logging in as a low level account and then only escalating up when they need to do something so an answer of because we tell them not to (laughs) is is that acceptable um no (laughs) (laughs) no you'd have to put something down saying yeah we do i guess that's in the policy at At least it's like a, a part of their job that if they if they were to do it then they kind of failed their policy and exactly there's kind of grounds to do something on there um, yeah, it's, it's awareness training and things like that. Yeah, yeah, very much so. 
Um, so 7.7 .7 is how do you ensure, uh, well, there we go, how do you ensure that administration <laughs> accounts are not used for accessing email or web browsing? Um, just follows the same recommendations. Yeah, follow the same thing. It? If you've got uh, um, logging or audit and enabled as well, you could view that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very true. And also things like, um, uh, particularly on servers, lots of the web browsers are locked down anyway. Um, yeah. They're in very limited modes. Um, you don't typically have email clients installed on servers, so you can't really get to anything apart from webmail. Exactly, and yeah. Those kind of things. And then 7.8 is, do you formally track which users have administrator accounts on your organization? Yeah, so this one's just making sure that you do a review of who's got administrative access. So if it's in um, Active Directory, you could just run a quick report or a, do a quick search, see who's got uh, rights to admin access. Um, if you're a smaller company, it might just be a spreadsheet that you just quickly review and say X, Y, and Z. Because it says there you must track by means of list or formal record. So an export from something like Active Directory would... would Class, classes yeah. that would be would be acceptable. Yeah. Cool. Seven point nine. Do you review who should have admin access on a regular basis? And I guess this would then fall into again your policy of um, making sure you're regularly reviewing that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just make sure you review actually who's got access, especially if a lot of people have left recently who might have been from IT or someone more senior. Just yeah. making sure you know nothing's been left enabled for them, especially like VPN access or something like that potentially. Very wise, yeah, yeah. Just housekeeping in exactly, general, really. Yeah. Um, not even just for admin staff, but in general, for make sure you haven't left your old staff accounts. Yeah. Um, we we do get that from time to time, where um, generally customers will tell us when the staff have left, but then sometimes we'll have a bit of a mop up and go, well, actually, who are all these like ten people? <laughs> and then well, they left five years ago, um, yeah. so we have a good old clean out of, of, of those accounts. But um, just make sure you stay on top of it exactly um, along the road, really. Seven point ten. Have you enabled two factor authentication for access to all admin accounts? And it, interesting, it says if your system supports two-factor authentication, um, then you must enable this for administrator accounts because things like Windows Server user accounts you can't really enable two FA that easily. Not easily. Start looking no. at yeah. external services and things. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's, I guess enable two-factor authentication where you can, where you're an administrator account, you know, Office three six five, enable it there. You yeah. know, any other services that you use, admin access, try and enable it if you can. You always say that yeah. for. Everybody really, particularly Office yeah. 365, just enable it. Yeah. If you're an ab admin or not, turn it on because there's so much stuff going around nowadays, um, and so many like malicious phishing attempts that two FA just pretty much all but stops it. Yeah, um, still things can get through, but does do a majority. It's a deterrent. Um, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Seven point eleven is if no, is this because two factor authentication is not available for some of your devices and systems? So particularly, I guess we'll use Windows Server because lots of people are still on Windows Server as an Active Directory. Is that an acceptable answer? Say we're using Active Directory, and they'd have to go out and buy a different system to kind of tie in to do that. Or is yeah, that um, yeah, exactly. Cyber Essentials doesn't expect anyone to buy any additional services to say yes. So if it's for the argument's sake, Windows, you just say um, on Windows, it's not applicable or not supported. Unless, of course, I'm going to catch you out here yeah. in that if you're not running antivirus, then you have to go and buy antivirus. Well, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Which I don't think we got. Well, to you yet. could use Windows Defender. <laughs> Oh, uh, true. No, very true. Yeah, yeah, good point. Or Windows Security or whatever it is now. Does it? Um, uh, does Mac built-in protection class, or do you have to buy Mac antivirus? Um, I guess you'd have to buy Mac antivirus, wouldn't you? Really? Um, I don't know. It's one of those things. It's quite secure yeah. as it is, but um, there's officially no. There's there's no real. Yeah, there's no real. Mac no antivirus any... protection built in, but it still yeah. is secure by default, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Parts in there, you have um, the scans for malicious files going on. I, I, I Depends on who's assessing, I guess. Does yeah, it? I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Depends uh, on the use case, I guess, and uh, the description. So there's no, that you put no down. specific question for it, but it yeah. does say it applies to computers, laptops, tablets, yeah. and mobile phones. But I would have thought mm. most businesses would actually install some kind of antivirus, anti malware Quite a lot in, don't a, on in a corporate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when you get big, big, bigger corporates, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I wonder if my brother-in-law works for IBM. I wonder if they install because um, they've been ob they obviously get offered whether they want a Mac or a PC. Yeah. And um, nowadays, I'll ask him. I'll find out. Mm. <laughs> um, so <laughs> section eight point one. This is all about malware. Uh, so things like phishing attacks, web protection, uh, email protection, antivirus. Um, eight point one is, and this is a bit of a multi-part question. So this will be interesting. Um, <laughs> are all of your computers, laptops, tablets, and mobile phones protected by malware uh, from malware? by either A, having anti-malware or software installed, sorry, A, having ma anti-malware software installed, and B, limiting installation of applications to an approved set, 
for C application sandboxing. So I guess you want to just cover off um, each of those just to explain what they are. So having anti-malware software installed. Yeah, um, having anti-malware software installed, pretty much it's antivirus software with a bit of malware protection put in. Pretty much all the providers these days have that, some kind of feature set within that. So you wouldn't have to go out, and um, I've seen a few people will go out and use things like uh, malware bytes yeah. as well as antivirus. So you don't have to go out and buy a specific malware product. Don't it can to. quite happily be antivirus with malware exactly kind of yeah added into it and then b is limiting installation of applications to an approved set i.e using an app store and a list of approved applications yeah so that could be um i forgot what the mac version is i store whatever it is or app store isn't app it? Store, yeah yeah or the windows store things like that so you, you could lock it down to just installing those so any other third party or unauthorized applications don't get installed so no jail no jailbroken devices exactly or anything yeah. on those lines yeah you're not allowed to jailbreak either under cyber essentials yeah Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then C is application sandboxing, i.e. by using a virtual machine. Yep, I've never actually seen anyone actually mark that one down, but that mm. could be a case of you've got a virtual machine on your computer and you open or install an application within that virtual machine that's siloed against your main operating system. Right, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. I guess, is that more for developers? Because they'll be sat there kind of sandboxing their various things they're I doing so. and then shut things down yeah. when they're not, um, not doing it. Or maybe MOD type related businesses, things like mm. that maybe. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, let's just skip past some of these because that says option... Uh, oh, no, we do have to answer with these. If option A, which was the um, antivirus, yep. where you have anti-malware software installed, is it set to update daily and scan files automatically upon access? As it says, yeah, make sure it's up to date. Um, gets updated, scans all the time. Cool. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. And then 8.3 is if option A again, where you have anti-malware software installed, is it set to scan web pages you have you visit and warn you about accessing malicious websites? Yeah, so this is the one where it's, if you're browsing the internet, is your anti-malware pro, um, software checking the websites that you visit? So if you accidentally go onto a malicious website, will it warn you and try and stop you from doing anything dangerous potentially? It says here, so on Windows 10, a smart screen can provide this functionality, yeah. so that's the built-in section within windows that's right yeah um is it set to scan web to visit and warn you about access and malicious google chrome does a fair bit of that already doesn't it can it? do yeah a lot of the browsers do a lot of stuff now yeah. yeah if option b which you're scrolling up that is the limiting applications to an approved set yep uh, where you use an app store or application signing are users restricted from installing unsigned applications and this does specifically say usually you have to root or jailbreak a device to allow unsigned applications yeah so again that's just primarily making sure all your mobile devices tablets are not jailbroken pretty much they go they come from an approved s store yeah yeah so you know they're safe to install basically exactly yeah uh 8.5 if you're option b again where you use an app store or application signing do you ensure that users only install applications that have been approved by your organization and do you document this list of approved applications yeah this one can get a lot of companies a lot of the time a lot of the time they say no and then they have to come back and say yes right. um, so <laughs> it's just making sure that you have an approved list of applications that people can install and use on their mobile devices and then just make it a, I guess distribute it across your employees and things like that so they know what's what IT policy again yeah IT policy there. yeah could be through MDM mobile device management things so like MDM is an option but not a requirement I guess for yeah. that yeah, cool. it depends on, upon the business and what they use. So MDM, just to um, clarify for anyone that doesn't know what it is, MDM's uh, mobile device management allows you to um, effectively restrict lockdown, whatever you want to do to mobile devices, um, which is great depending on the type of business because you can even restrict things like the use of camera, um, the ability to install new applications. You can push out applications through MDM software. It's, it's, it is quite powerful. Yeah. Um, but just to clarify, it's not a requirement. Um, it's a kind of a, like a nice to have if you do use it then. Pretty much, it yeah. Thumbs up. Cool. Um, and then 8.6 is if option C, where you are using, uh, where you use application sandboxing, do you ensure that applications within the sandbox are unable to access data stores, sensitive peripherals, and your local network? Describe how you achieve this. Um, yeah, so within the VM or the virtual machine, just make sure it can't actually talk to anything else, uh, making sure it can't talk to the host machine or the network or anything like that. It's just in that. Nice little silo. Locked away. Yeah, locked away, yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, and that is the questionnaire. I've just scrolled to the bottom. That seems yeah. to be it. I think there's a few more questions at the end of the online, which is where it collects information about the business, the, for the cyber, cyber essentials in, um, insurance and those kind of things. That's right, yeah, declaration form, uh, design yeah. and stuff like exactly that. Exactly yeah. all of those bits. 
Um, uh, another question from the audience is, uh, how often are new Cyber Essentials questions added? Do you have any security recommendations which aren't required for the certification that you think will be added in the future? This might um, comes back to what we were chatting about earlier, I think, where they're... Um, Cyber Essentials is about to go through a big, a, a big bit of a change. Possibly, I don't know if you want it to is. just elaborate a bit more. Yeah, um, I guess in the past, um, questions on Cyber Essentials probably got updated maybe once a year, once every other year. wasn't very often. Um, if you look at some of the questions, they can look a bit out of date. But at the moment, NCSC, the governing body who oversees Cyber Essentials, is actually going out a tender at the moment and is actually going to overhaul or revamp Cyber Essentials. Right. That is going to happen sometime next year, early part of next year going from there where it's going to get updated I guess made it more modern and go from there there's not much information out there at the moment about what's going to happen it's all oh, okay. disclosure and stuff like that so do you you don't really know what's going to happen I haven't got a clue what's going to happen work. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out in a couple of months hopefully and wow we'll, okay we'll go from there well I mean so that could be a big change yeah it hopefully but won't be as a, a dramatic change it would be, be nice to have a bit more uh I guess just centralization I think because where there are individual and I remember when I was first looking for Cyber Essentials, you go to the different kind of top tier, I, I as me and the other ones, yeah. you're going, well, which which one should I use? Yeah. And trying to figure out, and they've all got slightly different pricing depending on what, what options right. you go for. Um, so I, I as me have the Cyber Essentials Basic, they have the Plus, and they also do a, as a GDPR version as well. As yeah, they they've got their own I, um, I as me governance, which is like a low cost version of ISO 27001. Right, okay. So, so it doesn't small get you ISO 27001. It doesn't, but it works towards it, and it kind of maps similar um, towards ISO 27001. They've got their 10 steps to ISO, I guess you could say. Uh, right, okay which, then. which is quite good. Do yeah. you know how expensive that one is? That one's is? normally about £400 plus fat. So it's only an extra £100 for about an extra 100 and something questions. Oh, because it includes the it includes cyber essentials as part yeah. of it. Well, you do it all at the same time. An extra 100 time. questions, is that? Yeah. Wow. About 100 and something questions, yeah. And they're really... We, I think we looked at that, the... Um, I think I signed up for that the first time it came out when the whole GDPR thing came in. Yeah. And I went through it and answered it. I kind of used that to become GDPR compliant. Yeah. Then I, but I did what I was saying earlier. You go through, you answer yeses to everything. And then anything you write as no, you then write a big long list and then say, <laughs> I'm going to go and fix all of those. Yeah. Um, but then we've kind of done that the first year and then not done it the following years because then it's quite a big... I say it's quite a big commitment. That sounds really bad. But we stay on top of the GDPR, but not to the point of having to go through the questionnaire every year. Because it's yeah. a lot of old questionnaire. It is. Um, we are GDPR compliant. I will be very clear on that. We are GDPR compliant. But um, but yes, it's it, it's quite a lengthy one. And it's all very particular about... and diff It's all policy-based, isn't it? it so is. it's not one answer fits all. It's very much unique per business. It is. Uh, yeah, it's all about risk. Yeah. Know, yeah, exactly that. Cool. Well, thank you. I think that's probably... Yeah. If I say that's um, we've answered all of those questions. So, um, like I say, hopefully for everyone listening in, that has been useful. Um, if you do know anyone that's just about to take out Cyber Essentials, um, the certification, or is about to renew and isn't too sure, um, we often bump into people that want or need to become Cyber Essentials certified, but maybe don't have the money to go out and get a consultant in to to do the certification, or they might come in and and realise they need to. Um, buy a new antivirus product or buy a new security solution. So, I mean, so it's quite reassuring to know that you don't need to buy anything new specifically, yeah. um, unless you re really are missing the point on antivirus and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, and I guess possibly with two-factor authentication, no, because it's built into everything really nowadays. You don't have to go much. and buy anything for that. No. Um, so yes, if you do know anyone that's um, trying to take this certification, then um, get them to watch this, listen to this, whatever the best um, platform is for you. Um, and if you need anything else, need any help, um, give us a shout. And certainly do speak to Mark, uh, Marcus Dempsey. Best way to get in contact with you? Um, either via website um, or social media or on all platforms, pretty much. Just do a search What's the website for, address? Um, website is terabyteit.co.uk. Fantastic. Thank you much for your time, Marcus. No, Appreciate that. You. And um, yeah, see you all, see you all, listen to you all, speak to you all um, in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.